Hey everybody, it's Lon Seidman. We've got another fun mini PC from GMK Tech to check out. This is their G10, and it feels similar to the G3 Plus. That's one of my favorites because it's so cheap and so functional. This one costs just a little bit more and has a Ryzen processor on board. You do have to make some tweaks in the BIOS to get the most out of this, which I'll demonstrate in a few minutes, but it's a nice little mini PC that won't break the bank and has some expandability as well. We're going to take a closer look at this in just a second, but I do want to let you know in the interest of full disclosure that this came in free of charge from GMK Tech. However, they did not review or approve what you're about to see before it was uploaded and no other compensation was received for this video. So let's get into it now and see what this new mini PC is all about. Now the price point on this comes in at $199 at the moment as configured. You get that price if you click on the coupon code before you check out. Now inside it's got a Ryzen 3500U processor. This is an older AMD chip, but as you'll see when we tweak the power settings, it will outperform the Intel N150 chip that you typically see at this price point. It has 16 gigabytes of RAM and this one's got 512 gigabytes of storage. It is very easy to upgrade, partly because the case is very easy to pull apart. It's just all plastic here, so nothing fancy. But you can see how they packed everything in on this one. So on the left-hand side here, we've got that 512 gigabyte NVMe drive. It has another NVMe port over here, so you can put two NVMe drives inside. It supports up to PCI Express 3, although the newer PCI Express 4 drives should be backwards compatible. You just don't get the speed of the 4.0 bus. Now you could do some other stuff with this port. Uh, you could, for example, put in an Oculink adapter and get PCI Express cards for the desktop plugged into it like GPUs if you wanted to. That's probably overkill, but you can do uh, more with this extra slot than just storage if you want. One note though is that your PCI cards here, your NVMe cards, will go over your RAM module. So it is very compact here, a little too compact for comfort in my opinion, but you can cram a lot in here. As you can see, we've got dual channel RAM on here. The, this one has two sticks of eight gigabyte DDR4 RAM, and you can upgrade the RAM up to 64 gigabytes. Additionally, the storage can be upgraded uh, to 16 terabytes, eight terabytes in each slot. So you do have a bit of expandability on this one, which is kind of cool for such a small little unit here. Now as for ports, you don't have anything terribly exciting here. You've got your headphone microphone jack over here. You have two five gigabit USB-A ports here in the front. Now on the back, you're going to find two USB Type-C ports. You've got a power only port here and they include a 65 watt USB-C power adapter in the box. But this port here is full service. It's a USB-C 3.2 port that can do 10 gigabits per second of data transfer. And if you've got a docking station, you can plug the dock in, have the dock power the computer, and then you can get your video out and your data devices all working through this single port. So that was a surprise when I plugged my docking station in there and got everything booted up. But this one is power only. You can't do anything else on it but power the computer. So you do have a choice here as to how you fire this thing up. Right here, you've got a USB-A port. This is a USB 2 speed port, 480 megabits per second, so it's best suited for keyboards and mice. Here you've got 2.5 gigabit Ethernet. It also has a Wi-Fi 5 card on board, not a Wi-Fi 6 or 7. So it is a little behind on its Wi-Fi, but you've got 2.5 gigabit Ethernet here to make up for it. On the back here, you also have two display outputs, an HDMI and a display port. They say you can get up to 8K out of this. I only have a 4K display max, but I was able to get a 4K 60 display to work without issue with this. And because you've got the full service port here, you can have a maximum of three display outputs all showing independent images. So you do have a little more video output options than you do on their lower cost Intel model. And then you've got a Kensington lock here for locking it down on a desk, but you also have a Visa mount option in the box too. So a pretty versatile little machine that is quite upgradable. But why don't we fire it up now? And we're going to start this one off with the BIOS because you're not gonna get the full performance out of this thing unless you make some tweaks. Let's have a look at that. All right, so we've got it booted up now and we are in the BIOS setup utility. You gotta hit the escape key really quick when it comes up to get into this screen. 
And I want to point your attention towards this high performance option here under the power limit select option. And you have three different things you can do. You've got quiet, balance, and high performance. Now by default, it's going to be set to balance, which I believe is a 15 watt TDP. If you set it to high performance, you get 35 watts. So you do get much better performance when you select this but you have to select it because by default it's going to be on balance. Now when I set this up and started running my usual 3D Mark stress test to see how well it can handle itself under load, I got a really low score when I had the performance mode enabled. As you'll see on screen here, we got only 60.5% on that test and the processor was running pretty hot. And you'll also notice that we didn't get a great score when we had it in balance mode with that default setting. 82.9% on that 3D Mark stress test, which means we lost about 18% of the system performance under heavy sustained load. So for the moment, I would suggest leaving that fan on all the time. So in order to rectify that issue, what I did is I went over to the advanced section and then we went to hardware monitor and I selected system fan control. Now by default, it's on the disabled option here. And what that means is that it will automatically adjust the fan speed based on load, although it didn't seem to adjust it well enough for running this in high performance mode. So what I had to do was go back into this option, enable system smart fan, and I set the fan speed to 100%. What that means is that unfortunately the fan is running constantly in order to keep the system cool. And that resulted in a much better score on that test. We went from a horrible failing grade of 60.5% where we lost basically half the performance of the computer to going to 95% where we only lost 5% of the computer under heavy sustained load. And you can also see those temperatures are much nicer to work with. So that is what I had to do here. I expect that there'll probably be some kind of BIOS update to maybe make this fan uh, work a little better when it's in its automatic mode so it doesn't have to run loudly all the time. The fan noise isn't all that offensive here. It's not as loud as, as some mini PCs that I have looked at, but it is definitely noticeable right now to me as it's running. I can feel the air coming out of it. But this I found was the only way to keep it cool enough to not lose significant performance when it is under load. So a lot of what you're going to see here is running at this high performance mode. The performance I saw when I was in the lower mode was similar to, and in some cases a little bit lower than what I got out of one of my Intel N150 mini PCs. And when we do the benchmarks in this video, you'll see a comparison uh, in each of the power modes here so you can get a feel for uh, what you might need to set yours at if you go with it. So why don't we get into Windows now and see what we can do with this thing. All right, so we got everything booted up here with Windows. Like other GM K-Tech mini PCs, you get an activated version of Windows 11 Pro. So you get a few extra features versus the home edition. And the performance here feels pretty good. Again, I am in the performance mode now, so it does have a little bit more juice, especially at 4K60, which is what I'm running it at currently. As you can see here, web browsing is pretty responsive, even with videos playing here, so it has a good feel. It's definitely zippier in the performance mode than the Intel N150 machines that I've looked at running at the same resolution. So it's going to give you just a slightly snappier feel now I did play back some 4K60 videos from my YouTube channel. It does drop a bunch of frames, especially when everything is first spinning up. It does settle down after a while, but I did notice a good number of drop frames throughout playing back this video that we play back on everything. So this is where one of the more recent Intel chips, even the lower end ones, tend to do a little better than an older AMD Ryzen chip like this one does. But once it gets playing, the drop frames are much fewer, so it's not as noticeable, but you're not going to get video playback performance at 4K on this one like you might see on a comparably priced Intel model. And on the browserbench.org speedometer benchmark test, we got a score of 7.63 when we were in the lower power balanced mode and 11.2 when we were in the performance mode. So you can see you're slightly better than the N150 for web browsing when you've got performance mode set to on, and you're slightly below when you are in the balanced mode, and that was on a 1080p display. Now, as far as its network adapter is concerned, I get what I expect on the downstream, about 2.3 gigabits per second, and accounting for overhead, this is about what you get out of a two and a half gigabit ethernet adapter. 
One thing that I noticed though, which you will notice in a second here, is that the upstream bandwidth is a bit limited. Not by much, but as you can see here, we're only getting about 2.1 gigabits per second on the upload. Not a huge reduction, but still a noticeable one. And I did back this up with an iPerf test that I ran locally over my network. So there's definitely some kind of limitation on the upstream with the ethernet here, but again, not a big one. And the Wi-Fi is about what you'd expect out of an AC Wi-Fi connection here. Uh, what you're seeing is very close to what I got on my iPerf test that I ran earlier. Visually, the speed test just looks a little bit better. So for older AC Wi-Fi, it isn't bad, but of course, newer mini PCs that cost a little more have more robust wireless connections. And both the Wi-Fi and the Ethernet are running with Realtek controllers. Let's take a look at gaming now. So here is GTA 5. This is about the most uh, demanding game you could probably run on something like this. I am currently at 720p, and I've got everything set to the lowest settings, and we're doing about 45 frames per second or so. Sometimes it goes up to 50. If I go into an environment like one of the uh, safe houses or whatever, I can sometimes get to 60, but you're not going to do much better than that. You're not going to get a lot of AAA titles, at least modern ones, running well on here. But older games like this actually do pretty well, and here you're going to do better at this price point than you might see with an Intel N150 or N100 based PC. But again, you've got to get that processor setting at the highest point so you can get the performance that you're seeing here. Currently, while we're running the game, we're running at about 48 watts of power consumption according to my kilowatt down there. So this does consume a lot more power than those Intel machines do, but you get better performance here. And of course, newer Ryzen chips will do better on games like this. We can get Cyberpunk and Red Dead Redemption 2 to run on some of the more modern chips. But here you can get GTA 5 and other games of this era uh, working quite well. A lot of the newer retro inspired games should also work pretty nicely here too. Let's take a look at emulation now. So this is a PS2 emulator running Burnout Revenge and I'm only getting about 45 frames per second or so. I think I do a little better on the Intel mini PCs. And again, we are running at the performance settings here, so we're not doing great for some of the higher end emulation. Older stuff like the 16-bit games in the PlayStation 1 should be fine here, but this machine is struggling with the PS2 and the GameCube on up. And on the 3 d Mark Time Spy benchmark test, we got a score of 756 in performance mode and 394 in the balanced mode. As you can see, we're definitely getting better performance out of this machine than we get out of an Intel N150 on paper, but the Intel N150 ran that PS2 emulator much smoother than we're seeing on this one. And I think it's a combination of slower RAM and an older processor that is leading to some of those performance issues. So there are definitely some compromises here when you've got a system architecture that's six years old going into a new PC like this. Linux, though, does seem to work pretty well here. I'm running Ubuntu 25.04. Ethernet was detected. Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, audio, and video all seem to be working, which is good. Initially, I was on an older version of Ubuntu, and the Ethernet was not detected, but now it seems to be working. So my web browser here is functional, and I did switch this into the lower power setting here so you can get a feel for how it feels. I will say Linux at this lower power rating feels a lot snappier than Windows did. There's less overhead. So you might be able to get away with that lower power setting here uh, running on the Linux side. But it does feel pretty good here on Linux. And of course, you've got two drive slots on here so you could dual boot uh, Linux and Windows or maybe run some Docker containers on this or something. And when you have it in the higher power mode, I think you will get a decent server performance out of this, but because you need to leave the fan running all the time to get the best performance out of it, you might be best to lock it in your equipment closet or something here, but it does seem to work pretty well. Now, as far as idle power consumption is concerned, in the balance mode, which is where we're at right now, you're looking at 11 or 12 watts sitting idle, and on the performance mode, I was getting about 20 watts idle on this, so you'll definitely get a better idle consumption on that balance setting. So all in, this has definitely got some compromises as you saw as we worked our way through the review. 
I'm hoping they can come up with some kind of bio solution to get the fan working a little better. I would say if you were in the market for something at around this price point, the Intel-based N150 machine is probably going to be a little better, and that's what I would still go with. It costs less. There's less compromises here. It does better for retro game emulation, but there are some use cases where having something with this TDP, if you can keep the thermals managed, I think does provide some benefit, especially if you're looking to do home server work or something on a budget. That will do it for this one. Until next time, this is Lon Seibin. Thanks for watching.